Good morning, church family. <clears throat> I'm coming to you via video today because I'm actually at Lake Swan at our annual church camp, formerly known as Legacy Camp. I know we need to repeat things in order for everybody to have a chance to hear, but in case you haven't heard, uh, Legacy Camp, formerly now Church Camp, didn't want to get it confused with Pastor Mike's Legacy 55 Ministries. The idea being that several years ago, Pastor Mike and Pastor Juan began an intergenerational camp to try to <clears throat> encourage families uh, to grow together and for parents to disciple their children. And that's exactly what we're doing this weekend and the goal of that camp. The idea being that in the Bible, the primary place of discipleship is the home. And we want to fulfill our responsibility as a church in helping to equip parents <clears throat> to fulfill their God-given responsibilities and the vows they make when they have a parent-child dedication and make that commitment to disciple their children in the Lord. You know, <clears throat> I believe very strongly that that the reason that the gospel has weakened across uh, at least America is because in the home and in the family, we haven't been as intentional about discipleship. And I believe that's not just true for America, but that's true historically throughout the millennia of the church. You can trace it in regions of the world which had been strongly... Uh, populated by followers of Jesus who now followers of Jesus can't even be found there. And I believe it's because that we abandoned uh, the responsibility to pray for and to model for our families and our children what it means to follow Christ. Many of you have heard me say before and I say again, but a great quote from Bishop Sundo Kim in Seoul, South Korea, when I heard him in a question and answer session with myself and my fellow students when asked about his leadership development style in the church. And he said, I've always tried to live a consistent Christian life before my family in the home. Uh, and, and people thought he misunderstood, but he was, knew exactly what he was saying. And here's a church of 90,000 members, and he said that the way he developed leaders in his church was by being faithful to Christ in his home with his wife and with his children. So the home is the primary place, and we as DAC want to be an asset and a support to parents and families in that regard as one aspect, uh, an important aspect of our ministry. So that's the weekend that we're a part of here. And also, don't be intimidated by that. I, I want to encourage you to remember that how we live is our most important uh, disciple-making enterprise. In other words, the priorities of our life are contagious in the lives of our families as for those that are married and, and have children at home. Understand that just the way you're living your life every day is that which impacts them most strongly. Don't think that by discipleship we mean you sit down and have a Bible study together as a family. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying Pam and I, in rearing our four children, I, I don't remember one time sitting down and having a Bible study with our children at home. But we integrated the Bible into our life and into our um, exchange and discussions and decisions on a regular basis. And let me also encourage, if you're married, whether you have children or not, let me encourage you as husbands and wives to, to together make a commitment to Christ. Each of you say, well, we're each believers. Absolutely. But I, I say together, come before the Lord and together make a unified commitment to Christ as a husband and a wife. See how God blesses you. That's the most important contribution you can make to your generation and to the world 
is together be united in your commitment to Christ. My wife and I have had plenty of disagreements, believe you me. (laughs) Just ask her. But one of the things we've never disagreed on is that Jesus is first and he's number one in all things. And I believe that that's the most important thing God has used in my life, in our life, to bless our marriage is our common commitment to Christ that's absolute and supreme. So I encourage you in that. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the technology to be together even though we're apart. And so, Lord, as we open your word today and prepare to meet you at the table, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Today is Communion Sunday. We're celebrating the Lord's Supper. It's the summer of Psalms. And the message that I'm going to be sharing today and the passage that the message is built around, I don't think there's a more appropriate passage hardly in the whole Bible around which we can be brought to the table to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the focus and the goal of this message today is very simple. It's for us to have a perspective and an understanding of what Jesus was going through the night he was betrayed and he established the Lord's Supper. At the end of this message, I want us to be able to have a deeper understanding of what Jesus did and what he experienced so that we can understand that he did it for us to the glory of the Father and not for himself. The scripture that we'll begin with today is from Mark 14, 26. It says, speaking of Jesus at the Passover with the disciples when he established the Lord's Supper, eating the Passover meal with his Uh, disciples, as all uh, loyal Jews would be doing on the night of Passover, it says this, at the conclusion of the Passover, then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. What hymn did they sing? Well, we don't have to guess. We actually know what hymn they sang. Now, as we answer that question of what hymn did they sing, let's remember that the word Hallel is a Hebrew word which simply means praise. How many of us are familiar with the word Hallelujah? Hallelujah. That's not an English word. That's a Hebrew word transliterated the sound equivalent into English. It's a compound word. Hallel means praise, and Yah, Y-A-H, is a diminutive abbreviation for Yahweh, the primary personal name of God, which he revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3.14, I am that I am. And it's literally, if you take it from Hebrew to English, it's Y-H-W-H or Y-H-V-H, depending on which scholar you want to follow and what their opinion is. Well, how do you pronounce that? We don't know because the name of God is so holy in Jewish tradition that they never say it. That's the reason in your English Bible, when you read your Old Testament, sometimes you'll see Lord as capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That means that that word Y-H-W-H is behind that word because Jewish, (coughs) Jewish practice is that whenever... You read the Hebrew Scripture and you come across that word. You don't even try to pronounce it because you don't want to risk blaspheming God by mispronouncing his name. So they just substitute the word Lord, Adonai, or Lord. But Hallel Yah means praise Yahweh. Uh, One time when Pam and I were in a church planting ministry and uh, our congregation daughtered a Messianic congregation, we were trying to come up with names. Well, we ended up um, naming it something different, but my first thought was Beit Hallel, or Beth Hallel, Beit Hallel, House of Praise. Um, Nobody bought that. Brad, that just sounds weird. People won't know what that means. Okay, fine. But 
Hallel means praise. And there are groups of psalms in your Bible that are called the Hallel Psalms. And they are found in three separate collections in the psalms. First is the Egyptian Hallel, which is Psalm 113 to 118. And then the, quote, Great Hallel, which are Psalms 120 to 136. And then the concluding Hallel Psalms are 146 to 150. As one Bible commentator puts it, the Egyptian Hallel Psalms received a special place in the Passover liturgy. As 113 to 114 were recited or sung before the meal, and 115 to 118 were sung after the meal. So we know exactly when they sang a hymn and went out, we know exactly what Jesus and the disciples sang. They sang Psalm 115 to 118 at the end of the meal before they left. And that's the reason today we're going to zero in on a portion of Psalm 118. You know, we equate praise with positive experiences, right? But <clears throat> Jesus was eating with his disciples. One of them was in the process of betraying him, who had sat at the Passover meal at the table with him when he established the Lord's Supper, had, had, was betraying him. And Jesus knew that he was going out to be betrayed, arrested, falsely accused by his own Jewish people. He was going to be tortured by the Romans, um, even, and he was already even, even beaten before the Sanhedrin. And he was going to be tortured by the Romans, and then he was going to be murdered by the Romans on a cross. But hallelujah, he also knew that he was going to rise again on the third day because he had no sin of his own to die for. Unlike us, who have to pay our own death sentence, if it were us, but it's not us, it was Jesus, and he paid the death sentence for us at the cross. So Jesus was in a time of great stress in his life. But let's look at selected verses from Psalm 118 and let's see what the lyrics of the hymn that they would have sung sound like. First, let's look at verse 17. I will not die. <laughs> Whoa. Think of Jesus, what he's thinking in light of that and where he is and what he's experiencing right now. I will not die. I will live to tell about what the Lord has done. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not let me die. Wow, how would Jesus processing that? As, as he sang those words, the disciples were clueless, but understanding the, the significance of those words in Jesus' life at that moment. And then look at verse 19, what Jesus sang that night. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. Notice Jesus knowing what's coming that night. He's giving thanks and praise to the Father for victory in the midst of... I mean, if you know you're about to be betrayed, you're about to be beaten and tortured, you're about to be murdered in a cruel, horrific fashion within less than 12 hours, and then verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Hmm. That, he knows that's about him. That's about him. He knows this psalm 
is prophetic and he's singing a song that he realizes is about him he's the stone that the builders rejected you know the builders the 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 uh, the metaphor there being the, 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 the people of Israel is the builders and the cornerstone and so forth. He's the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see. In other words, this is God's plan. This is the Father's will for him to fulfill the desire of the Father to redeem you. But how in the world can you call something like that wonderful? If you're the one, it may be wonderful for us if you're the one that's enduring it. I'm always amazed that we know First John, or we know John 3.16. It talks all about Jesus, how he died for us. Everybody knows John 3.16. It's very popular, but very few people memorize 1 John 3.16. And 1 John 3.16 says, Oh, by the way, since Jesus died for us, we need to be willing to die for one another. Well, we're not as excited about that, are we? But Jesus was excited to please the Father and to do the will of the Father, even if it meant death and torture. And then verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Look at the context of that statement. I'm always amazed. There's a very popular chorus that many times we sing, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord... And man, we're all happy. Whoa, oh boy. And listen, it's, what is it, August the 4th today? That, that, that line's not talking about August the 4th, 2021. That line is talking about the... Look at the context. That line is talking about the day that Jesus was betrayed and crucified. That's what that line is talking about. And we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. What? Yeah, we rejoice and we're glad, but we should be grieved that our sin caused him to have to go through that. And then it says, Please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You, we bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it to the cords of the altar. Those would be words of greeting for pilgrims going in and out of the temple. But Jesus knew it meant something much bigger. He was the sacrifice that was about to be bound as he was nailed to a cross. And he's the ultimate fulfillment of that. That is what he's saying the night he instituted this meal. That is the hymn he sang. And he sang it with praise. You know, one of the basic slogans back in 2006 when I came here, the Lord laid Acts 1-8 on my heart, and I did a deep dive into that sentence. I found out several things as I really, really studied it diligently one of the first things it's not a command it's a prophecy when when we were received the holy spirit like they did on the day of pentecost then christ becomes our life and we are transformed into his image so that when people meet us through us they meet christ and we're evidence that jesus is alive and so i came up with a phrase that's intended to be provocative because although the Bible talks about bragging about the Lord all the time, I mean, it's, it's a term in Greek in the New Testament that some translations actually use the word brag, so it has a biblical precedent. But it seems to me, to summarize Acts 1-8, is that if we brag on Jesus in everything we do, then everybody we meet, we'll meet will have an opportunity to know who Jesus is, not by just what we say, but 
even more significantly by the way we treat them to verify and confirm what we profess. And one of the slides we use in the Discover DAC class is this slide, and I say, you know, hey, for me, this is, this is I, I'm lazy. Hey, I want to do one thing that's going to touch all the bases. You know, when I, when I brag on Jesus to an unbeliever, it's evangelism. When, when I brag on Jesus to another believer, when I say something, because all of us need to know who Jesus is, if you think you, you know all about Jesus, you're clueless. We're going to be learning more about him for eternity because he's infinite and we're finite. But the idea is that we're to help each other get to know Jesus better so we can be more like Jesus. And so when we brag on Jesus to each other, then it's encouragement. When we brag on Jesus to Jesus, it's praise. And praise is powerful. Look at Acts 16 sometime. You get a chance. Paul and Silas were in a Philippian jail. And at midnight, sounds so similar to Jesus, right? You're in jail and chains for the sake of doing nothing wrong but telling people the truth and loving them. Uh, that's what it means to suffer with Christ is when the hand you're trying to feed with gets bitten. The, po the point being that they're singing praise at midnight in the jail and... God is so blessed by that that God causes, whether it was the Holy Spirit directly or angels, I have no idea. That's his, his concern, not mine. But the, the jail shakes and the doors fall open and, and the, the jailer is about to kill himself because he's afraid... That because if the prisoners escape, it'll be his life. And Paul says, whoa, we're here. We're not going anywhere. Just chill. We're good. And, and the guys, at this point, he's heard them. He knows what they believe. He's heard them. He, they, they haven't been preaching at him. They've been praising God. I had a friend once said, Brad, I'm convinced evangelism is nothing more than praise, praise to God in the presence of unbelievers. And, and the jailer's proof of that because he said, Sirs, what must I do to be rescued? And, and praise is powerful. Someone once said that praise is the devil's death knell. Praise is the devil's death knell. I, first time I learned this, and again, some of you have been around maybe a while remember this, and hopefully uh, you've either forgotten or haven't heard it before because many of you... Uh, I'm sure haven't heard it before, but when I first learned this functionally in my life, I was a senior in high school, and I remember I had an appointment uh, to take a test or something at the school, and I was, I was pressed for time to get there, and I'm driving. Um, my, my dad, he always had a nice car for my mother, and he always drove, <laughs> drove the cheapest junker he could find. And I'm driving uh, Dad's car, and sure enough, a mile from the house, it quits, and I'm, I'm dead on the side of the road. And I'm so frustrated because it's like, I'm, and so I'm, I kick the tire on that old car, and, I'm, and then the Spirit of God just overwhelmed me. And I stopped, and I said, wait a minute, this isn't right. And I just started praising him on the side of the road. Lord, I praise you. Thank you, Lord, for this old junk of a car. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The car didn't start, but I changed. I was transformed. A peace came over me. I said, well, it is what it is. Got to deal with it. I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about it. And the joy of the Lord became my strength. That's the first time God ever taught me that. When do you typically praise God? When life is easy or when it's hard? When did Jesus praise the Father? Psalm 118. The song that Jesus sang after he had given us this meal. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. 
Let all Israel repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants, the priests, repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord repeat, his faithful love endures forever. In my distress, I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Think of what Jesus is thinking when he's singing this, knowing what's just around the corner. Yes, the Lord is for me. He will help me. I will look in triumph at those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Though hostile nations surrounded me, I destroyed them all with the authority of the Lord. Yes, they surrounded and attacked me, but I destroyed them all with the authority of the Lord. They swarmed around me like bees. They blazed against me like a crackling fire, but I destroyed them all with the authority of the Lord. My enemies did their best to kill me, but the Lord rescued me. Hallelujah, Sunday morning. (laughs) The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. The strong right arm of the Lord is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not let me die. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his faithful love endures forever. Hallelujah. Amen.